Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right. So welcome to the Great California Cab Shootout. Freestyle Friday edition. This is part one of a three-part series that will talk about how wines are priced. Today's show will go deep into the costs of making a wine at all levels, from extreme value to icon. Extreme value to icon. Well, that's not extreme value, it's value. Uh, this is the ultimate in pulling the curtain back and will serve as my beginning of my How the Sausage is Made series of Freestyle Friday episodes. Now, Sit back, this is going to be a long episode. I'm not gonna break it up into two episodes. I probably should, but I'm not going to. Now, as you can see, I've got a collection of six Cabernet Sauvignons from the 2016 Vintage in California. Everything from an entry level or value wine from California to an icon wine from the Diamond Creek AVA in Napa Valley. In part two, I'll give you some information about each wine. In part three, I'll do a blind tasting of all six wines to see if I can tell the difference in quality and if that matches up with the price. All right, having been in this industry for over a decade, I've heard many a winemaker or winery owner say, if you want to make a million dollars in the wine industry, start with 10 million. I'm sure there's other industries that this applies to. During my travels to various wineries, I've seen the equipment needed to make wine. It's not cheap. If you want to make wine, you either need to have a pile of cash or take out a six to seven figure loan to do it. The pile of cash method can be great if you don't care about getting your initial investment back and just want to turn a profit each year. The loan method means you get to factor in that cost, of, uh, cost in order to uh, make a profit, you know, paying back the loan. All right, so today let's talk about why in the world does this wine here only cost 10 and the full bottle version of this costs $250. The final price of a bottle of wine is dependent on many factors. They fall into the following categories. Cost of raw materials, cost of production, administrative and miscellaneous costs, supply chain markups, brand or reputation. These categories are essentially true of just about anything you buy. Cars, clothing, computers, food, etc. For certain things like wine, the old adage location, location, location is one of the most important parts of this. Let's start with the cost of raw materials. This can be a bit tricky in that a winery can have any combination of own fruit and purchase fruit. For purchase fruit, the price of that fruit will be dictated by most of the criteria I just listed. Cost of raw materials, cost of production, administrative and miscellaneous costs, and brand and reputation. That is of the vineyard or who you bought it from. Now, if the winery owns all the fruit, they still have a cost of raw materials, but that cost may be different than just purchasing fruit. For the sake of simplicity, I'll just talk about purchasing fruit because I have access to those numbers in, in California for the 2016 vintage. You actually can get it for every vintage in California. I'm sure those states have it. I just don't know. I, I just never looked for them to, to see what, what they are. Now, I can't know what the internal costs for any of the wineries uh, that had at least some, if not all, their grapes come from their own vineyards. Like this is all their own stuff. A lot, some of these higher end, it's all their own stuff. All right, the cost of the grapes is directly tied to location. In much of the wine world, the more specific you get as far as where the grapes come from, the higher the value of those grapes. Think of it like an archery target. This is the typical example used in the industry. For our purposes, we have California as the outer circle. Then in order of smaller and smaller circles on the target, we have North Coast, Napa Valley, Diamond Mountain, Gravelly Meadow Vineyard. This system of smaller targets is the basis of the way Burgundy works and is adopted in various forms around the world. The difference in Burgundy is that you have designated vineyards whose quality is illegally classified as Premier Cru or Grand Cru, with Grand Cru being the highest quality. A few of the places in mostly Europe will have these quality levels legally defined, sometimes in the form of the Premier Grand Cru system or some other geographical boundaries. Other times it's a broader system that uses 
a variety of criteria such as ripeness or sugar level at harvest, minimum alcohol level, minimum amount of aging, uh, and classifications that rank wineries. I'm probably forgetting one or two, but these are the most common. One of the most common in Europe is the word reserve on a label. Most of Europe legally defines the use of, of the word reserve. It can indicate a minimum of alcohol level and or minimum amount of aging. These imply higher quality. In most of the New World, that is not Europe. These terms are rarely legally defined. In the US, you can use this term however you, know, however you see fit. It has no legal definition. The use of a vineyard name is always allowed on a label as long as it meets whatever legal requirement for the country of wine growing area. Basically, all the grapes came from that vineyard. This implies a very high quality wine, but like many things, the reputation of the vineyard comes into play. I don't know of anywhere that it doesn't have to be 100%, but there might be something like, oh, 95% have to come from the vineyard and 5% can come from somewhere else. But I'm pretty sure everywhere is 100%. One of the biggest things that determines the value of the grapes is the actual value of the land and the associated property taxes. In some places, the property taxes aren't that high, especially for agriculture, but let's just go with that. So just like your house, land is assessed of value, and there's usually some kind of tax involved with that. You can have amazing grapes grown on inexpensive land, uh, and these are your value plays. Now, the kind of agriculture comes to play also. Conventional, organic, biodynamic, regenerative agriculture, they all have their associated costs with them. How much is tied up in labor like hand harvesting and other vineyard maintenance? Or is a lot of that handled mechanically? Labor is one of those biggest controllables in really in any business. The more labor, the more money it costs to operate. If you can increase the productivity of your workforce, it can save you money. Machine harvesting and other mechanized equipment uh, helps drive down costs over time. The cheaper the wine, the more likely the vineyards are harvested are not harvested by hand, they're mechanized. This ratio is true in most parts of the world. However, in certain countries, labor is so cheap that mechanizing the work in the vineyard isn't as advantageous financially. So you can find wines under 20 bucks that are hand harvested. Some of this is also due to a winery having enough staff on hand to have, say, an all hands on deck mentality when it comes to harvest. Given a large enough winery staff, along with family, locals, and volunteers, a winery with a decent-sized production can do hand harvesting on the cheap. A lot of times, at least in the U.S., you'll see wineries as uh, you'll see wineries advertise for harvest volunteers to work for the day. In return, you usually get fed and come home with a bottle or two of wine. Sounds like a good deal, right? But the reality is that that really cost them less money than to actually pay you the market rate for harvesting. It's hard work. I have no plans to ever do it. It sounds romantic, but you're out there sweating your, you know what, off, sweating your butt off. And usually you have to be there to do it right. You need to be there like at four or five, maybe six in the morning. So it's not so hot. And then you got to deal with all the stuff that happens in nature. So that's why I'm not doing it. Anyway, but I have mad respect to everybody who does because I'm like, you guys who do that every year for multiple days a week. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, it may be a break. It may also, this also having volunteers and all that may be a break even for them if, you know, uh, they're building brand loyalty. Uh, they're not being done by larger wineries on a massive scale. So you're not going to see, you know, uh, I don't know, some like Gallo jug wine having, hey, come out for the day and harvest for us. That, no, that's not happening. It's it's a machine that's doing it. All right, some wineries will have a grape stomp day uh, or do something similar. That's really just a marketing thing about, about uh, since the amount of wine that would come from that, uh, you know, like one or two days is really minuscule to the wine that would be machine pressed. Essentially, grape value and labor can be a significant part of the final price of a wine. The labor piece isn't confined to just the vineyard, but to all the staff in a winery. Harvest labor is a big expense, but it lasts four to eight weeks, you know, most of the time. However, there are other tasks that happen in the vineyard, and some of it can be mechanized, so that helps reduce the number of year-round workers in the vineyard. Now, there are things like fertilizers and pesticides. Both of these can be synthetic or organic. Use of animals in the vineyard, compost, biodynamic treatments, and other things Basically, the entire cost of farming will come into play. A conventionally farmed 
vineyard that's mechanically harvested will have lower cost grapes than any other kind of farming or, or harvesting in general. Yield is tied to all of this too. Higher yields mean cheaper grapes. And these kinds of vineyards are typically conventionally farmed with very low labor costs, like everything's mechanized. Very large vineyards like this will give you the cheapest grapes. Organic and biodynamic vineyards will generally be smaller, have lower yields, and usually more expensive grapes. Regardless of whether you own the vineyards or buy the fruit, all these costs come into play for the final price of the wine. Cost of production. Now by this, I mean once the grapes get into the winery. So all the equipment costs, labor, utilities, valuation of the property and building, the associated taxes with that, insurance, supplies like bottles, corks, and the most expensive of the group, new barrels each year. French oak is the most expensive, followed by American oak. After that, you have in no particular order, Hungarian, Slovenian, and even Russian oak barrels. Basically, anywhere grapes grow, you can make barrels. They have to be the right species of oak. Other wood can be used, but oak, as, oak, oak has stood the test of time as the best type for the kinds of wine most of the world drinks. French oak barrels are anywhere from $900 to $1,400. American oak is typically half that price. The standard barrel size that most wineries use is the Bordeaux Barrique, which is 225 liters. That's the equivalent to 25 cases or 300 bottles, give or take how much wine is actually in the barrel when they're going to bottle it you tend to lose a little bit during the winemaking process. Some of the most expensive equipment will actually be things like the fermentation tanks, be they stainless, st stainless steel, concrete, or large wooden vats. Other fermentation vessels that are more specialized are usually smaller and are like concrete eggs, amphora, and even the same kinds of barrels used to age wine. These can be newer used barrels. On a dollar per gallon measurement, this can be very expensive. The cost of this equipment varies greatly the large steel, stainless steel tanks that are normally used for fermentation can run upwards of $10,000 or more. It all depends on the size of the tank and any special features. These $10,000 tanks will be very large. Just a, a quick search for pricing, I found a 1,250 liter tank for only about 5,500. That's only enough for 5.5 barrels. I found a pretty basic one that holds 10,000 liters for about 10,000. There are tanks as high as 30,000 that hold over 10,000 liters. I found a lot in the $15,000 range that can hold more than 10,000 liters. What's the cool thing about some of these tanks is that they have a variable, uh, they have like a bladder or whatever. So you don't have to worry about filling it all the way. Let's say one year you have a, a bumper crop and next year you don't. So you can adjust how much goes into the tank without having a lot of oxygen because that's bad. Anyway, other expensive equipment includes crusher to stemmers, presses, and sorters. These can run anywhere from a few thousand to tens of thousands. Depending on the goals of the winery, additional equipment may include machines that can do alcohol adjustments, uh, also centrifuges, cryo-maceration, micro-oxygenation, or known as microx, or one that's called flash detente. This last piece of equipment is pretty rare. Flash detente, or thermovinification, can be used to increase extraction or concentration of the must. It can also be used, in theory, to remove various forms of taint, like smoke taint not cork taint, because the, the, the wine's already in the bottle at that point. Additional equipment includes pumps, hoses, forklifts, barrel racks, lab equipment, filters, you name it, tons of stuff. Much of this equipment is expensive, sometimes extremely expensive. If we're talking hundreds, thousands, or hundreds of thousands of dollars, the costs associated with it do eventually show up in a bottle of wine, but the cost is usually amortized over many years. Smaller wineries tend to not have a lot of that specialized equipment I listed. Cost is a major factor with that, but also smaller wineries tend to not do a lot of complicated adjustments. Then you have other things like yeast, yeast nutrients, sugar for chapitalization, mega purple, acidification, oak alternatives, fining agents, and other things used in the production of wine. All right, so you've made all this wine, right? Now you have to get it into the bottle so you have a few options. The cheapest option is to bottle it yourself using what's known as a bench top manual filler. Then either manually labeling or some type of automated labeler. This is fine for the smaller wineries, something like, you know, the order of 5,000 to 20,000 cases a year. But these aren't cheap. A full setup can cost a few thousand dollars new. That's new, so you can buy used if you're starting out, right? 
Your next option after that is to use what is known as a bottling truck. Now, this is a self-contained bottling line in a trailer, like a semi-trucks trailer. These are great for smaller wineries too. There are some big advantages to going this route. Wine Business Monthly has a great article on just this subject. I'll, I'll quote them about why many wineries use bottling trucks. All right, quote, sterilization issues, extra labor, coordinating the bottling with other time-consuming issues in the winery, and a lack of confidence in their ability to properly run the machine, end quote. These are complicated machines that really need someone who knows what they're uh, doing to operate it. For the most part, a winery is only going to bottle for about two to three weeks throughout the entire year. Lots of time in between bottlings for people to forget how to use the, the bottling line. For the larger scale operations, it makes sense to make the investment a full-fledged bottling line. They're going to be bottling a lot more often and can have a team that's dedicated to it. These bottling lines can cost as much as $100,000 or maybe even more. All right, the big advantage to owning your own bottling line is flexibility. The ability to bottle on your own schedule. With a bottling truck, you have to schedule it, sometimes months in advance. For smaller operations, it's worth it. Now, speaking of bottles, there's also a wide range of bottles to choose from. Quality, color, shape, weight, etc. From dirt cheap to relatively expensive. Corks are the same. Screw caps can save you money, but sometimes they are more expensive than the cheapest cork. Bottles can range anywhere from just under a dollar to as much as $3 per bottle, maybe even more. Corks can be found for about 20 cents a cork, and as expensive as $3. Foil, this stuff right here, that's around 10 cents, maybe more. Some wineries, some wines don't use it. I don't have any, well, this doesn't technically have a foil foil. It's part of the whole screw cap thing. But this wine here, which I already reviewed, this has no foil. Okay, so you save a little bit of money on that. Labels can also have a wide range from a few pennies to a few dollars. Then there's packaging, wooden boxes, cardboard boxes. Some of the cheapest wines come in the flimsiest of cardboard boxes, practically falling apart when they reach the restaurant or retail shop. I hate them. Every little bit helps to keep that bottle of wine under 10 bucks. For imported wines, the extra expensive overseas shipping has to be considered. So when you see that $8 bottle of wine from another country, a lot of, that, a lot of the cost cutting a lot of cost-cutting, cheap land, cheap labor, and cheap grapes made that possible. Now, just so you know, the importer is paying for that shipping, but it still needs to make economic sense if we're going to price that bottle at eight, seven, six dollars, even if it's coming from another country. All right, the amount of wine produced will also function will also be a function of the final price. Economies of scale come into play for the entire operation. Smaller wineries tend to have a higher average price of wine compared to larger wineries. Within all this, you have the production of individual wines. Generally, less cases means higher prices. All in all, the larger the operation, the lower the overall cost to produce wine. Also, not every wine can afford to buy this equipment or have the need for it. Some of your larger wineries will rent out equipment to other wineries to use. So that's a little bit of a money-making thing, right? The bottom line, just because I mentioned it doesn't mean a winery is using it. But your value price wine is probably utilizing much of these things in order to make that wine. Administrative costs. Oh, that's the exciting part, right? You know, the day-to-day -day expenses, payroll, tasting room supplies, other non-winemaking non equipment, vehicles, employee benefits, compliance costs, or excise taxes, repair and maintenance, new construction. You know, you get the point. Some of these can be as much as anything else, especially if you have, a, if you have high paid employees that are not already the winemaker or vineyard manager and their assistants. All right, now in the US, the TTB or the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, formerly called the ATF, taxes wines and other alcohol based upon the type of wine and alcohol content. As of August, 2021, this is the current excise tax. All right. Still wine tax rate per wine gallon, 16% and under alcohol by volume is a dollar seven cents. Over 16 to 21% uh, ABV is a dollar 57 per gallon. Over 21 to 24% alcohol by, alcohol by volume is three dollars and 15 cents. Mead is a dollar and seven cents. Low alcohol by volume wine, those that's containing less than 
less than but not equal to 8.5% is $1.07. I know we have artificially carbonated wine. So this is kind of tricky. It's, it says over 0 0.392 grams of CO2 per 100 milliliters injected or otherwise added. Uh, I think somewhere I was supposed to come up with what the atmospheres are. Maybe I did, but that's $3.30. Now, when you go over that figure of 0 0.392 grams of CO2 per 100 milliliters of that, so you have naturally occurring, that is $3.40. Hard cider contains it, that if it contains at least 0.5% and less than, but not equal to 8.5% of alcohol is 0. Oh, sorry, is, is uh, 22.6 cents. All right, so let's take that winery that produces 35,000 cases. That works out to about 83,214 gallons. So they would have to pay the TTP just over $89,000 in taxes. Now that only works out to about 21 cents per bottle. Not a lot, but every bit counts when you're figuring out a per bottle cost, especially if you're gonna have a cheap wine. Also factor in the cost of the buildings, the winery, the tasting room, the accessory, any accessory buildings. Was this new construction or did they buy existing? If you bought existing, did any equipment come with it? And was the equipment in good condition? And what other repairs or construction will be required? And finally, the value of the brand or the reputation of the winery or even the winemaker. You can find plenty of examples in many of the products we buy. Fashion is the one that comes to mind the most. So take two, article, two articles of clothing. They can appear to look and feel the same, but a combination of materials, labor, and branding determine the final price. Now, this is not to say that the $10 cab has the same quality as, say, the $80, uh, but just that, just that both will have a lot of the same things when viewed from the outside. This can be the hardest thing to explain to a wine consumer. Many times your average consumer will think the two will either taste the same or that the more expensive wine will taste better, but not necessarily significantly better when they're told of the price difference. The concept of reputation and cost was codified into law in 1855 in the classic Bordeaux classification of that year. You have five different growths or levels, uh, and then the wineries were put into those growths. All this was based on the selling price of the top 62 red wines in the Medoc and Graves part of Bordeaux. Now, one winery was absorbed by another over the years, and only one actual change to this ranking was in 1973 when Chateau Mouton Rothschild was elevated from a second growth to a first growth after decades of lobbying. Now, there are also 27 dessert wines that have their own separate ranking system from 1855, and they're divided into three growths. A hundred years later, in 1955, saint Emilion did a similar ranking system. Theirs was supposed to be updated every 10 years. It has had a few updates and changes, but there's been some controversy and backlash over the past decade or so with two of the top wineries actually leaving the classification this year. I doubt that their reputation or the retail price will uh, diminish as a result. There are numerous other lists that attempt to rank wineries all over the world. Many are done yearly. They are usually from the wine media or even retailers. And then you have the critics who give out scores to specific wines. Watch my wine ratings or like bungholes episode from my opinion on wine scores. Anyway, it, if a particular wine gets a really high score, like 97 to 100, then you can bet a few things will happen. One, it'll sell out. It may take a while depending on the production. Two, the price of that vintage may go up. It may not, since the wholesale price rarely goes up after a wine score comes out. But what can very likely happen is that the following vintage or vintages can increase in price across the board, winery, distributor, retailer, or restaurant. Keep getting great scores, then that reputation builds, and so does the price of the wine. Now, of course, there are also all the associated yearly increases in costs a winery has to take into account, raise prices to absorb it, or find a way to cut costs and keep your price the same. Or maybe no increase in price and take less profit. You can also increase production to increase revenue, but keep the pricing the same. Or increase the prices. What are you going to do? Economies of scale do work in this case or, or, or are into play. The price of wines we have uh, here undoubtedly are influenced by reputation, especially the more expensive ones. Let's cover a couple more things. First, 
the price categories of wines. Now, this is pretty much an industry standard and the list is based on US dollars. Now I got the following verbatim from the Wine Industry Advisors website. So we have extreme value wines. Their average cost is about four bucks. And this category is made up of mostly bulk wine. Value wine, that's average cost is four to $10. Described as basic quality bulk wines from large regions or producers. Then you have the popular premium wines. That average cost is 10 to 15, that would be right here. That'd be large production, decent variety, varietal wines and blends. Then you have premium, 14 to $20. Good, solid quality wines. Then you have super premium, 20 to 30 bucks, great handmade wines, medium, large production wineries. You have ultra, ultra premium, this is where this one's at, between 30 and 40. That'd be considered great quality, handmade, excellent tasting wines from small to large producers. Then you have luxury, 50 to $100. Excellent wines from wine regions made by near top producers. Then you have super luxury, that's 100, 200. Wines from top producers from microsites. And then you have Icon, which is $200 and plus. This is the pinnacle of wine, pinnacle of wines, wineries, and microsites. And they can go even higher. There's no, there's no category above the 200 plus. So this is the same category as Screaming Eagle or Domain Romani Conti. The description for the super premium category, that $20 to $30 range, talks about handmade wines. Now, I'll differ a little bit on this. While you may find that the higher the price of the wine, the higher the craftsmanship, I wouldn't necessarily say that all wines starting at $20 bucks are handmade. I say there's a decent amount of high volume, uh, rather than say bulk wines in this category. This is true even when you go higher in price. I know of luxury wines that have production numbers of more than 10,000 cases or 120,000 bottles. Not the total winery production, but the individual wine. I'm not saying these wines are industrially made wines, just that these are not small lot wines. Many of these wines don't rely on heavy adjusting to be made, but there is still an incentive to keep the quality and taste consistent. To be fair, there are a lot, and I do mean a lot of wineries, that charge anywhere from 20 bucks to $100 for their more premium wines that are made in smaller amounts from a few dozen cases to a few thousand. So that's something like 600 to 36,000 bottles. The industrial wineries are making hundreds of thousands, not a few million bottles of individual wines. I just add to this, the first growth Bordeaux winery, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, produces about 35,000 cases or 420,000 bottles of wine each year. This is assuming they're all this size, which they're not, but we'll assume they're all this size. 15 to 25,000 of that was what they call their Grand Vin or Grand Vin, or their first label. The rest goes into their second label, Carrods de Lafitte, or Car Carouads, I think it's Carrods de, de, de Lafitte. All the first growths have a total production of at least 30,000 cases, you know, all their wines they make. So what is the retail of this Grand Vin that I talked about? The 2015 is between $800 and $1,000, depending on where you buy it. Their second label, the 2017 Carras de Lafitte, is between $250 and $450. The, the point of this is that this is a winery that produces two wines. It would not be considered a boutique winery based on production. While there really isn't a definition of what a small winery or a boutique winery is versus medium, large, and mass produced, I wouldn't consider 35,000 cases to be a small winery, like a medium size. You know, I, I would call a small winery something that produces 5,000 cases or less. And so here's the deal. When it comes to boutique wineries, their wines will almost always cost more than the equivalent quality wine that is made in greater quantities. We see this all the time all over the country, even in California. Countless small wineries that have less than 5,000 or even less than 2,000 cases per year need to charge a minimum of 30, 40, even 50 bucks for their wines. That's just to break even or make a small profit. It's part of the supply and demand equation and rarity. The winery will spin that their wine is small production or even handcrafted. The reality is that they are so small that no one knows who they are, except for the people who know them, right? So the rarity or low production is really a lack of demand. I mean, it's not that the wine is poor quality, it's just that the wine is, in reality, overpriced. So they need to spin the story to highlight the difficulty of making the wine or give some kind of perception of value. They are competing, in essence, with larger production wineries or wineries with lower costs for whatever the reason, many times just because of economies of scale. It's when the small winery starts to get noticed that they'll need to 
figure out how to meet higher demand. They make that wine, make more of that special wine, create a lower priced wine to keep the lights on, create even higher priced wines, or some, com some combination of the above. Now, let me, let me backtrack a little bit on this. I'm not trying to say that you're buying a, a, a wine from, say, Texas that's 50 bucks. They only make 300 cases that I'm saying it's overpriced. But a 300 case production isn't a lot. And they got a lot of bills to pay. So the equipment they're using isn't being used to its full capacity or full potential. So in order to make their money back on what they had to spend to use that equipment, say they were at a custom crush facility, not that they bought all the equipment themselves or they have some of the equipment, they got to make their money up somehow. So when you have maybe three or four wines of like 500 cases each, you're going to have to charge a lot of money for that to make up your money. That's what I mean by it's overpriced in the sense that if you get the same quality wine of something that was maybe 5,000 cases or 10,000 cases of, of, that, of the same quality wine, their costs are a lot lower, so they don't have to charge as much. Doesn't mean they don't, but they don't have to. All right, anyway, uh, or go back to what I was talking about. The winery may have gained some notoriety and may have been expensive from the start, you know, like $200, $400, $500 or more per bottle. These lines are wineries like in California that the guy was, or the girl was like, my wine's just good. My wine's worth 500 bucks right off the bat. And I make, you know, 2000 cases of it. So I'm going to charge you that. All right. So they might make hundred cases of the wine. So yeah, the small amount causes it to be expensive because they got bills to pay too. Like I said, it's mostly in California, a lot of times in Napa. All right. So in Texas and basically everywhere, not part of the big four of California, Oregon, Washington, and New York state. You easily find small wineries whose wines will run 30 to 50 bucks in order to turn that small profit like I talked about. People who try the wines from the other 46 will often complain that they are paying more for a wine than they would have paid for the same wine from California. You know what? They're right. Support the local retailer or support the big box store. The local retailer gets to know you, goes above and beyond with customer service. The big box store knows that if you stop shopping there, somebody else will replace you. You're just a number. Okay, I'm going to end the first part. I'm going to end this episode right now. Uh, I don't actually know where I'm ending it. I just know that this episode went really, really long. So we're going to break it up into two episodes. So um, the usual ending of all this, if you like what I'm doing, hit the like button and subscribe. Tell your friends about it. Tell them all about the best wine show anywhere. Part two of this episode is coming up next week. So make sure you check it out so you can get the full story of why wine costs what it costs. Later.